We're going to be speaking about the emotional center in the coming couple of months, actually. It's part of or symbolized by the harvest of grapes. Every center has its yield and uh, just like in nature, just like in farming and to farm the emotional center, we have to start by studying it. And for that, I'd like to share a very interesting genre of art, ancient, relatively speaking, coming from Egypt. Egypt, among other things, is for its mummies. Yes, the very elaborate burial, uh, well, usually of pharaohs, not only, also of noblemen, but the, uh, the more important or the higher ranking the deceased, in this case Tutankhamun, the pharaoh himself, the more elaborate the burial. In the case of Tutankhamun here, it probably reached a kind of a artistic peak that never, um, uh, I think it's the gold, I actually don't think um, there is any other pharaoh or it is known of any other pharaoh that was interred in such an elaborate way. Um, or if there were, the tombs were plundered and never survived. Um, and in that respect, Tutankhamun was unique in that it actually remained intact until the 20s of the last century, almost exactly 100 years ago when the tomb was found. But it is not this that I want to study together. This is from a period in Egypt called the New Kingdom, which is roughly around 1500 BC. Tutankhamun comes a little later, maybe two, 300 years later, 13, 1200 BC, a long, long time ago, yes. Many years later, when Egyptian enters Roman times and actually passes the common era, so after the birth of Christ, in the first centuries of the new millennium, you know, 100 AD, 200, 300, the ritual of mummification still exists and actually has by, by now spread to the common people so you don't need to be a pharaoh i mean you need to you need to have some financial abilities but of course you're not going to bury yourself in gold encased in many many different casings like tutankhamun did but still you do want if you're a commoner to be mummified but it is done in a much humbler uh, and of course cost effective way as this mummy here and at that period, because of Greco-Roman influence that has come in, in fact, Egypt has become Roman at that time. So it still retains the Egyptian tradition, but it now also has absorbed, has absorbed Greco-Roman culture. Then on the face of your mummy, they put a portrait, a very particular, a very realistic portrait. And since... Most of these were found in an area in Egypt called Fayum. They're called, they've come to be known, the Fayum portraits. And some of us have seen them together in museums. They're very nicely scattered around the world. So you see them not only in Egypt, in museums all over the world. We're going to study together some of these portraits because they have a very peculiar emotional quality to them and it will require our emotional center to read them. And that is my aim today. I want in part to show us all how we actually have this function. We actually have this center that can look at people or portraits and get an emotional read from them, even though it knows nothing about, as, as we don't, even though it knows nothing about these people, the circumstances of their death, the circumstances of their life, and so forth. We, we have no knowledge, so our intellectual center is in the dark. We know nothing about them, but our emotional center can still get a lot of information, as you will see, uh, through looking at their visual impression. Before I zoom into some of these and ask some of you for your impression, I want you to observe how, especially when I zoom in to these portraits, 
I want you to observe your emotional center in action. This is not something we are accustomed to doing. We are accustomed to being identified with our emotions. I don't like him. Or why is she like that? Or why did they do? Or what's this thing in their nose? Uh, our emotional center is very emotionally instinctive, yes? Is very quick to judge. And we are very quick to identify uh, with that judgment, to say, I, I don't like this. Or who is that? Who do they think they are? I want you to resist that, since this is a very controlled environment. And as I show, we have three uh, Fayum portraits. A as I show each one, I want you to give as much attention to being aware of your emotional center reacting to the impression as the impression itself. Okay, that's the challenge. Get ready. And here we are with the first. Observe your emotional center reading this face of this woman who lived some 2,000 years ago and whose portrait or um, whose life was chosen to be summarized in this portrait, because that's what these portraits were, weren't they? They were kind of a summary of one's life. This is this is this particular lady interred here in this mummy, in this coffin, and so forth. What does your emotional center read in the facial expressions? Let's start with you, Gerald. And don't be shy. Don't be polite. You don't have to like her. So I'm asking your emotional impression. Yes, I'm not asking for the objective truth of who she was because we don't know and I can't cross verify. I just want your emotional impression of this lady. What does your emotional center read here? Uh, um, well, I like her. Um, she's young. I find her attractive. I like her. She looks kind. Um, like she would be a good person to know. Okay. Uh, already good start, Gerald. Uh, the emotional center is very is um kind of the opposite of impartial. Yes, I like. I don't like. Um, and uh. This is something for this is one reason it's so difficult not to identify with it is immediately it has to do with, me, with her in relation to me. Um, for, for all of us, of course, not just Gerald. I don't like, I like, uh, I oh, I want to get to know her better. Or no, I don't, I don't like her. Uh, it's, it's immediately injects a kind of an impart, uh, um, a partiality, if you like, or a kind of a, a personal point of view into the impression, making identification even more heightened. Good, very good start. Kelly, what about you? And do not be shy and do not be polite. Yes, Kelly, tell us if you don't like her and why. Um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, it, yes, I like uh, not um, her eyes. I keep focusing on her eyes and kind of a, um, a curiosity. Yeah, there's like a, a, a little bit of... Um, questioning in her eyes um she's maybe it's the eyebrows that also are just feeling they're a little um stark and uh, you know drawn um almost like a like a questioning um in her eyes uh i don't have a real strong like or dislike for her she just looks pleasant she doesn't not, not, not either strongly one way or the other Okay, thank you, Kelly. Uh, you know, uh, you point to her eyes. Can you see, at, at least the way I see it on my screen, um, she's actually not looking quite directly at us. Can you see that? Right. She's gazing a little bit. You see that? Can you see that on the screen? It's quite, it actually leaves quite an impression, uh, mm -hmm. very different than if she were looking at us. Does anyone have any emotional impression of that? What, what does that, and again, observe observe how this happens. 
what does that how does that impress your emotional center that she's actually not staring directly at us yes um I, I seem to have the opposite sort of emotion when I look at her um I feel like in a way that she might be a bit entitled that her eye might be criticizing another I don't know and a sense of like power to her but I don't know, I seem to be reading the opposite. <laughs> and that's fine. And Tamara, I'm, I'm happy that you, um, that you mentioned that. I also get a little bit of the feeling, which is one reason I, I chose her. There is a little bit of um, snootiness to her. Yes, I'm, some, right? Something like that. I'm yeah. something, something oh, of that. Or at least I'm about you or something. Yes, a, a little bit. Um, now, again, see how we know nothing of this woman. Tamara and I never met her because she died 2,000 years ago. Um, and our emotional center, and, and we may be wrong, of course, Tamara and I may be completely wrong. It doesn't matter. We have a function in us that reads her face and interprets it that way. And, of course, Tamara, if she were alive today and we happened to meet her, and we were not careful, Tamara, we were not observant that this is our emotional center, we may easily form a judgment of her without even knowing anything about her. You see what I mean? Sitting in a cafe, let's say you and I went to have a coffee and she was sitting in the neighboring table. Well, Gerald and Kelly would have formed a positive impression of her. And you and I would have said, oh, you know, who's that? who does she think she is? If we were not careful and if we would have attached ourselves to that emotion, that would have become our reality. That's one way the emotional center works. I want you to see that it, it doesn't matter at all whether our emotion, the emotional impressions we've been sharing today are correct. And of course, we cannot verify uh, in any way. Just to show how our emotional center works, it immediately reads and then um, if we're not careful, if we identify with that reading, we flow with it. Yes, Samir. The, with the faces, and I've been really struck by this for the past few weeks where I've been noticing um, my wife or people that depending on their emotional state or however they are, the muscles of the face, and I know there's quite a considerable number of muscles in the face, but they really are, in the case of this example, of this exercise um, or, or reading people emotionally, it's the, the muscles are the moving center and yet they reflect, you know, I'd love to know what your thoughts are in the relationship between how the moving center is all these muscles, but it's at the command of the emotions. And it's just so it's, it, it can change so dramatically to reflect the emotional or instinctive pleasure or displeasure or negativity, positivity, but the way it can uh, reflect that, it seems to me to be two centers together. Yes, and it's always that way, uh, isn't it, uh, Amir? Because even, for example, your and my talking right now, we're using a moving center, but we're conveying intellectual ideas. We can, we're conveying meaning. So there is always this synergy between the centers. But you are right. Uh, it's not, it's not um, the moving center is here... Um, a means to uh, uh, express an emotional impression or read or state. Yes, that's how it is. The centers always collaborate, uh, but there's there's usually one dominant center. And in this case, the dominant impression is emotional. The moving center is only a means to convey that. Let's look at another portrait uh, of a man now. Again, observe how immediately your emotional center has an opinion. It's not, it cannot remain impartial. This is how all the centers are. You may also observe that while the emotional center is very quick, really almost instantaneous to form an impression, it takes a much longer time to formulate that impression into words because the intellectual center is slower. So you may not immediately be able to say he's like this or he's like that, but the emotional impression is almost instant. What do you feel 
about this man, Eva Maria? What would you say? I see he is uh, open and interested whatever uh, whatever happened happens in front of him. Thank you, Eva Maria. Very nice. Quite young, yeah. Yes, uh, both of them actually are quite young. Um, I do not know to say whether uh, this would be the age of their deaths. It's likely it would be, but um, anyway, they're very young, obviously. Yes, openness. Who else? Monique, what do you feel about this man? I feel that he's uh, kind of a, a sensitive type of, like, romantic. Like, he likes the ladies kind of thing. Okay. That's... Yes. He looks good looking, eh? He also looks... He yeah, because might... he's kind of smiling. He has the... Like he's easy going. Okay, very nice. Last but not least, another lady with a lot of emotion, as you see. This is quite remarkable, actually. This is 2,000 years old, yes? Um, a, a little, a little less than that. Um, I think one of the reason these Fayum portraits have uh, captured uh, archaeologists' attention is it's it's like somebody's looking at us through time. They're so alive, um, but they've been dead for 2,000 years, especially in a portrait like this. There's a lot of life in it. What do you see? Shwaib, how would you read? What is your... And again, uh, uh, do your best to separate from the emotional impression. It's not you. It's not all of you. It's only your emotional center. And then share with us. What do you see? Uh, I kind of read uh, depression, sadness, like listless, no particular emotion, then uh, hopelessness. Hopelessness, sadness, depression. Yes. She had a difficult life, didn't she? It appears so. Yes. And you see, we do not have the intellectual information of what happened. You know, did she lose her children? Was she carrying an illness? That we don't have and we cannot have. Um, if, if it were more current, we could, but we cannot have. So we remain with a partial impression that our emotional center reads. I read it very similar to you, Shwey. But we are denied the intellectual information, the context, what actually happened uh, to make her feel like this. Shuria, what do you feel? What do you see on the face of this woman? Can you hear me also? Yes, if you just speak a little louder, but we can hear you. All right, so she looks quite sad to me. Her, her eyes look swollen as if she's just like finished crying. And her facial muscles are quite relaxed, so it's like she's almost given up on something. Uh, that she was really looking forward to, maybe something in life, a major goal of hers, but it's just ended. So she was quite sad about it. That's what I see. Uh, uh, and her face looks uh, plainer than the other ones. So in the other pictures, I noticed that there was some kind of tension in the face, hers looks quite relaxed. So um, the eyebrows stand out on each portrait to me. The first one, they're very arched, so they have a sharper look to them, so kind of contemptuous. She looks like as if she feels contempt towards something. She was looking down on someone. The second portrait is almost as if looking at someone as his equal and his kind. His eyes are caring. And the last one, uh, her eyes look quite uh, sort of dead. So that's the general impression I'm getting. Lovely, Shuri. I'm glad I asked you. Uh, it was quite um, perceptive and also to compare them in this way. 
Um, if you did not, or all of you, yes, not only Sharia, if you did not have an emotional center, uh, you could not do what we just did. Yes, this is the function we have. If I, I have a little poodle, a very sweet little poodle, she has an emotional center, uh, a poodle emotional center. Yes, she wiggles her tail and she's happy to see me when I come and she's sad when we leave her at home. But you need a human emotional center. If I, if I lifted her and showed her this screen, it would mean nothing to her. Only a human emotional center, uh, a human emotional function has the ability to glean all this information as all of you did regardless of whether it is objective or not that's not what we're speaking about it's just the the, the um uh, verification that we have this ability we have an emotional center by the way before we continue these are all painted on wood that was the technique used back then the um this uh, Roman era Egyptian uh, mummy was had this wooden or or they kind of embedded this wooden panel onto the mummy and then painted on it in a certain technique that was then um, taken and evolved and developed into the icon. Those of you who are familiar with Greek icons, uh, the Orthodox Church more so than the uh, Roman and the Catholic. Um, but Russian icons actually are known to be a kind of a, a development, a later evolution of, of this technique, a much later evolution, yes, centuries, centuries later after this. So this is a very interesting moment in art where ancient Egypt is spilling into the Roman era and then eventually into what will become Orthodox Christianity. Those of you who know icons, those of you who come from countries where the Orthodox Church is more active, know that they have this very penetrating gaze. It comes from here. It comes from this. The only thing with icons is that they almost never portray common people. They almost always portray saints, uh, obviously Jesus, Mary, and other major people in the church. Here in their point of origin, these are portraits of common people, and many of them. From George Gurdjieff, back to the emotional center. We educate nothing but our mind, but the horse has no education, whatever, the horse, of course, symbolizing emotions. Inner change, refers only to the need of change in the horse and the emotions. If anyone thinks that self-study will help and he will be able to change, he's greatly mistaken. Because all this knowledge will belong to the driver, the intellectual center, and he, even if he knows, cannot drag the cart without the horse. It is too heavy. The horse is the emotions, the cart, the body, the moving instinctive, and the mind, the intellect. Inner change re refers to change in the horse, and so the exercise with which we began meant to flush out our emotional function, the way it functions, the way it perceives, uh, is an obvious start because this is what we need to learn how to work on, how to bring up to speed. We assign different harvests to these uh, three primary functions. We finished harvesting wheat last month, which symbolized the intellectual function. And entering September and through August, we will deal with the emotional function. Just like the intellectual function, the emotional function, uh, according to the theory, can work with different types of fuel. It can work with a coarser fuel designated or, or one that corresponds to World 24. And it can work with a much finer and more volatile fuel designated by World 12. We're going to have to understand the flavors of these, the different flavors of our emotional center working with one and then with the other. 
These worlds we showed in the last workshop I hosted, world 12 corresponds to the sun. We showed it back then in relation to the moon, the, the intellectual center corresponds to these lower worlds. But now we're speaking of the emotional center and the hydrogen of the fuel that the emotional center can function on. And world 12 corresponds to the sun, which ties in beautifully with this annunciation image by Fra Angelico. Uh, you know, just, just like... Um, when I showed uh, how things develop through time, nothing stays the same. It's very wrong when you study any religion, any ancient teaching, uh, there is a tendency to think that what Christ meant 2000 years ago was what the generations that followed him then practiced and understood, or Moses and Judaism, or Muhammad and Islam. Uh, and this is very naive. Nothing stays the same, least of all understanding. And understanding evolves or devolves from one generation to another very rapidly. You can see here that even custom changes quite a bit. Back in the New Kingdom, this is how you mummified. And then the technique and also the access to this changed in the course of the coming centuries uh, immensely. So it became this, much more humble, but at the same time, much more accessible. And then you had, as a result, these uh, Fayum portraits. And these continued developing, morphing, evolving into icons, which are, again, are a completely different concept, although the same technique to these death portraits, death masks, if you like. It's the same in Christianity. When we look at this 15th century painting of the Annunciation that many of us actually saw together in the Prado Museum in Madrid, it's big, it's very nice uh, to study because it's so large when you, uh, when you visit it in the museum. If we know anything about Christianity, we know this is the Annunciation. This is the moment the Archangel Gabriel appears in um, Mary's chapel to tell her that she has been chosen to be the mother of God. This is the Archangel. This is Mary. But it is very naive to think that Fra Angelico, the painter's understanding or relation to the Annunciation, is uh, anything to do with uh, Christians today or even Christian artists today. These understandings change a great deal from generation to generation. I say this because I just showed you how in, um, in the theory of the fourth way, world 12 corresponds with the sun. The sun plays a very dominant role in this icon, in fact, uh, sorry, in this painting, it is the sun that is impregnating Mary. Or another way to look at it is that something very special about this woman, this young lady, enables the absorption and the impregnation by the sun, which after all is hydrogen 12. Right? We just saw it according to the fourth way. In other words, you can see that there is a correspondence, in the, especially in these early Christian uh, paintings. There is a correspondence to a lot of the esoteric ideas you see in later systems like the fourth way. The emotional is usually represented by the feminine, intellectual by the masculine. We are studying the emotional center, so we will focus on the emotional. There are, however, two women in this on this canvas. Obviously, there is Mary, but there is another woman. That cannot, of course, be random or accidental. She's right here. This is Eve at the moment of being expelled from Eden. Yes, we see something unfortunate is happening here. She's being sent away by this angel uh, from paradise. 
And then here in the foreground, we have the same lady, actually, the same model, the same blonde young uh, lady, young maiden. But here she is absorbing. She is uh, receptive to hydrogen 12. Or in other words, we have two modes of our emotional center. On the right, how it looks when it is uh, um, receptive to or able to work with hydrogen 12 yeah, on the right and on the left when it is incapable of containing that fine hydrogen and so it loses paradise. That's how we're going to look at this painting and that's going to be the subject of today, these different modes, these two different modes of the emotional center and we're going to see that the main distinction between them is identification. When we looked on the Fayum portraits, I told you, don't just form an emotional impression. I like her, she's mean, she's sad. That's easy to do, uh, even unconsciously, but try to observe your emotional center generating these emotions. Then you're doing something special. Try to, in other words, not be identified with the emotions as they arise. Or in Gurdjieff's words again, man is at the mercy of everything around him because he can never sufficiently observe himself at the moment when something attracts or repels him. Because of this inability, he identifies himself with everything. So we have to learn how to unidentify ourselves with our emotions, which are very tempting to call I. To make this more personal and practical, I posed the following task a few days ago uh, to all the community. I said, in preparation for today, I invite you to ask a close friend or family member which groups of eyes you are particularly identified with. Ask them, for example, which topic of discussion reliably gets me excited or which subject situation cons consistently makes me angry? People around us see our identifications much more easily than we do. It's quite obvious for them, you know, oh, don't talk to him or her about politics, you know, then you get them started. Or don't talk to him or her about money. They, everyone knows this except we. We are blind to ourselves. And so the exercise is meant to take advantage of this obviousness to our environment and turn it uh, to our favor. We'll share some of your observations now, uh, rather some of the feedback you received. And this also, Christian, will be the point uh, in order to keep people's privacy to uh, end the public part of the recording, okay? Good.